Analytic Philosophy and Marxism, hosted by the Platypus Affiliated Society. The Platypus Affiliated Society, established in November 2006, organizes reading groups, public fora, research, and journalism, focused on the problems ta and tasks inherited from the old, new, and post-political left for the possibilities of emancipatory politics today. Here in Berlin, we host um, reading groups, a German and English one, on uh, Wednesdays, we host um, coffee breaks on Thursdays, and pub nights once, I think every third Friday of every month. And teach-ins such as this one, um, and a teach-in on the climate crisis next week. Um, same time, same place. Uh, we all, we're also going to host a, a European-wide conference in January which will include other teachings and panels. Um, it's from January 25th to January 28th. Yeah, that's it. Um, as of today, as for today, um, Jack's going to talk about analytic philosophy and Marxism. And the teaching shall be prefaced by the following words. Philosophers have hitherto only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. For Marx, the 11th thesis on Feuerbach was sufficient to deal with the relation between philosophy and revolution at the time. In 1966, Adorno described the arrival of a new age of philosophy, writing that, quote, philosophy which once seemed obsolete lives on because the moment to realize it was missed. The summary judgment that it had merely interpreted the world, that resignation in the face of reality had crippled it, in itself, becomes a defeatism of reason after the attempt to change the world miscarried. Quote end. The 11th thesis was surpassed by history. Has this also happened to Adorno's hypothesis? Or has Adorno simply been lost on us? Amongst other philosophical disciplines, the left has not quite managed to leave behind an analytic philosophy in any clean way. The analytic Marxists and their analytic methods still torment some on the left, either as a source of important updates to vague Marxist categories, or as a regressed form of Marxism that simply got things wrong. Perhaps this is, a, this is because analytic philosophy has entered, in, uh, has entered a more enlightened state or dangerous state. Analytic philosophy would appear to have changed significantly since 1966. Indeed, analytical Marxism had its heyday at the end of the 70s. And today, the, his the, the story of an analytic philosophy is one of apparent success. It has long thrown off all taboos of metaphysics, and it is the dominant force in most major philosoph philosophy faculties around the globe. So... What is the state of analytic philosophy today, and what is its history? How does the left today understand its relation to analytic philosophy? And what does this tell us about the present state of that left? Cool. Thanks, Max. Yes. <clears throat> so, I have uh, about nine pages in front of me. I uh, managed to get it down to that. Um, so I hope it'll, I'll only speak for about 40 minutes or so. I'm thinking it'll probably go a bit longer, but I'll try and to keep it under that, and then there'll be Q&A for as long as um, people ask questions, and not longer than anyone wants to stay. So, before I address analytic philosophy, I wanted to first address those two passages I put in the preamble there, just so everyone has a grasp of some of the history between Marxism and philosophy. The two passages are meant to refer to two moments in that debate. The first moment is that of Marx in 1845, in the run-up to a period of high revolutionary activity, ending in 1918 with the failure of the German Revolution. The second moment comes after 1918, when Stalinism and National Socialism rise to the world stage. The passage I take for the second moment is from Adorno's Negative Dialectics, written in 1966. But I could just as well have taken a passage from an article by Korsch from 1923 namely Marxism and Philosophy, which we read in Platypus next week, actually, in the English reading group. So, casual finger point to that uh, next Wednesday. 
The point of choosing these two moments um, was to characterize a movement in the dialectic of theory and practice. So, first with Marx. It's 1845. The time is one of high revolutionary potential. The class character of the revolution would continue to develop and clarify itself to the socialist movement in the following decades, as, classes, as clashes sh showed who was on whose side. At this time, practice was seen not um, only to be possible, but necessary. To repeat the passage from the preamble, philosophers have hitherto only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. The idea of the thesis is not that philosophy is wrong or bad, but that the limits of philosophy and its role in making history had, reached, had been reached. As Engels said, the proletariat was the inheritor of German idealism. Philosophy, in its essence, could not live up to the demands of revolution. Even if philosophy granted sensuous human activity, as Marx calls it in the thesis, um, as necessary for the realization of freedom, philosophy couldn't actually perform such activity. Such a thesis was never supposed to be an absolute truth, and it appears as though it required reassessment after the revolutionary movement stalled. The thesis was the judgment of a certain historical moment. The new historical conditions had pushed the dialectic of theory and practice firmly to the side of theory, and as such seemed to wake philosophy from its state of impotence. Adorno gives the most succinct judgment of this at the beginning of the negative dialectics, and he's rather explicit in his reference to Marx's 11th thesis. So to repeat that passage. Philosophy, which once seemed obsolete, lives on because the moment to realise it was missed. The summary judgment that it had merely interpreted the world, that resignation in the face of reality had crippled it in itself, that becomes a defeatism of reason after the attempt to change the world miscarried. Adorno did not wish to reinstate philosophy. He wanted to indicate how it appeared mended by the failure of all socialist movements. Adorno thought that in this rejuvenated philosophy, the problems of the past would again be approached, but perhaps with a renewed aggression. To quote from Weistel Philosophy. In the case of the scient scientific trends within philosophy, this meant thinking would lose its element of independence. The autonomy of reason would vanish, the part of reason that exceeds the subordinate reflection upon an adjustment to pre-given data. Such philosophy, scientific, which, thought to, which sought to, amongst other things, explain empirical reality and shine a light on the rational thought process, constituted an effort to prevent thought, therefore, and freedom and the self-determination of human society. It was really a resignation. And yet it was also a return to the Enlightenment project that aimed at liberating human beings from fear and installing them as masters. But for Adorno, such was not necessary for philosophy. Something more self-critical was possible. So to quote from uh, Weiss of Philosophy, the undiminished persistence of suffering, fear and menace that necessitates that thought cannot be realized should not be discarded. After having missed its opportunity, philosophy must come to know, without any mitigation, why the world, which could be paradise here and now, can become hell itself tomorrow. Such knowledge would indeed truly be philosophy. It would be anachronistic to abolish it for the sake of a praxis that at this historical moment would inevitably eternalise precisely the present state of the world, the very critique of which is the concern of philosophy. So, when it comes to the philosophy of his time, Adorno's work is focused on two main strains of the 20th century. These are Heideggerian ontological philosophy and analytic philosophy. I want to deal with the understanding of the latter tradition on the left today, and I hope that I've already elaborated on Adorno's feelings about it. One can understand analytic philosophy in many ways, and as with many things, one's account of it will be as good as one's general theory of the present. The left has addressed analytic philosophy a few times in its history, and it continues to do so today. Adorno addressed it, as I just mentioned, and recently it's the analytic, analytical Marxists that have come into the view of the left once again. Of course, the analytical Marxists were on the left's radar in the 70s and 80s. I'll try my best to get at what I see as the root of the matter, and then I'll come up to other more recent, the more recent attempts by the left. 
Considering the history of analytic philosophy should open up those passages from Marx and Adorno, which I've mentioned, and then also, hopefully, those recent analyses. So, what is analytic philosophy? <coughs> I suppose my broad hypothesis is going to be analytic philosophy is a philosophical tradition that attempted to take up the Enlightenment project of empirical scientific progress after Kant, empirical scientific and logical progress after Kant and Hegel appeared to fail to live up to their promises of truth and freedom through thought. Through thought. Kant and Hegel always appeared somewhat like counter-revolutionaries, especially when we stand them next to Isaac Newton or David Hume. Kant and Hegel were metaphysical thinkers, seemingly divorced from immediately sceptical methods, abound in religious thinking, extending meaning beyond direct sensory impressions. In the same vein, the authors of the early works of analytic philosophy place themselves in opposition to Kant and or Hegel, directly or indirectly through the interpretations of the neo-Kantians or the neo-Hegelians of the time, sort of 1880s, 90s thinking of. And they do so often in the name of very much Baconian principles, and in some cases often the sort of Comtean praise but discontent with this Baconian view. To analytic philosophers, they were perhaps for the first time capable of fulfilling the Enlightenment dream of knowledge and power. To quote from Russell, The old logic put thought in fetters, while the new logic gives it wings. It has, in my opinion, introduced the same kind of advance into philosophy as Galileo introduced into physics, making it possible at last to see what kinds of problems may be capable of solution and what kinds are beyond human powers. This is Bertrand Russell writing in 1912 in a paper entitled uh, Logic as the Essence of Philosophy, and it's the second chapter of um, a bigger book, Our Knowledge of the External World. And for me, it captures the hopes of analytic philosophy, those hopes it had with respect to what it was leaving behind, and how it was to get where it wanted, with new logical concepts developed by, most specifically, Gottlob Frege, which essentially allowed a much greater ability to express complex logical arguments. I can talk a bit about that later if people are interested, but I think that's about as far as I can go. So really the, the summary of that quote from Russell, I think, is something like, leave the old logic, realise the full potential of man with the new one. For me, Russell, together with Frege, formed the core of what I'm going to call the first wave of analytic philosophy. Frege's Grundgesetz der Arithmetik, um, written two volumes, 1893 to 1903, and Russell's and Whitehead's uh, Principia Mathematica, written in 1910, are two large encyclopedic, encyclopedic texts, texts abound in decompositional conceptual analysis, both attempting to defend logic and specifically its foundational role in mathematics. They took, as part of a logicist program it's called, all mathematical truths to be logical, the project was directly opposed to Kant, they felt, who held that mathematical truths were not true in virtue of meaning and logic alone, that one had to consider the world as well. Frege, held, um, uh, Frege and Russell held that, based on logical, abstract contemplation alone, one could uncover all mathematical judgments. The logicist pro project also opposed Hegel by defending a single logical system. Russell personally had a dispute with Bradley, the British idealist, who was seemingly the sort of neo-Hegelian representative or Hegel representative of the time in Britain. So these early analytic philosophers had such respect for logic in this sense. Frege puts it the following in uh, 1893. Logical laws are laws of thought insofar as they legislate how one ought to think. They are the most general laws describing how to think wherever there is thinking at all. If anyone has any different convictions, let him try to build a similar construction on them, and he will find, I believe, that it does not work, or at least that it does not work so well. And I could only acknowledge it as a refutation if someone indeed showed me a better, more enduring building that can be erected on a different basic conviction, or if someone proved to me that my basic principles lead manifestly to false conclusions but no one will succeed in doing so. And so may this book, uh, the Grundgesetz, even if belatedly, contribute to a renaissance of logic. 
And for Frege and Russell, logic was the elaboration of laws of thought. It was thought's attempt to understand its expressive limits, the boundary of thought, of sense, of reality, as incontrovertibly as possible, with no logical gaps. And the problems and promises which they felt rested in such a project are very much, in my opinion, the same problems and promises which belong to the projects of later analytic philosophers. And as such, really the whole of analytic philosophy takes on the Enlightenment, anti-Kant, anti-Hegelian character um, in much the same vein as Frege and Russell. So, what I'm going to call the second wave of analytic philosophy appears to have had a much greater impact than the first, but for the reasons I just gave, it's unthinkable, really, without the first. And I will paint the history of analytic philosophy in such a way that it appears the breakdown of any programmatic attempt to realise the hopes and solve the problems of the first wave is what brings about a crisis in analytic philosophy. After Russell and Frege, Rudolf Carnap and Ludwig Wittgenstein are the two figures that come to my mind when I think of analytic philosophy. Carnap was a German philosopher and one of the founders of logical positivism, positivism or logical empiricism, which is a philosophy generally associated with the Vienna Circle, a group of scientists and mathematicians and philosophers living or working in Vienna around the 20s and 30s. Wittgenstein was an Austrian philosopher who spent most of his academic life, though, in Cambridge, England, under Russell. Although he did attend some Vienna Circle meetings in the early 20s, and uh, the Vienna Circle's attitudes to his thought, in fact, caused a few splits within the group, quite funnily, separate from Wittgenstein in the late, like, late 20s. Um, but Wittgenstein never upheld logical positivism. Despite any associations with specific views, Carnap and Wittgenstein's positions changed quite radically over the course of the second wave. This is something I could talk a bit more about the Q&A if people want to, but otherwise I thought it's best to leave it. Of course, though, it's important to address logical positivism. Logical positivism, in short, characterizes all meaningful expressions as either empirical, relating to immediate sense data, or logical, able to be defined purely logically. The critical thing I want to get at is where they differ or not from Russell and Frege. On the logical side, logical positivism was for a very long time really just a program of logicism, that initial project I brought up which Frege and Russell defended. Um, and indeed in terms of form, Frege and Russell's encyclopedic logicist programs were deeply inspirational for the Vienna Circle, and most notably I think Rudolf Carnap's Aufbau is, is very similar in form. Indeed, Carnap was one of the few to attend Frege's lectures in Jena in the 1990s. Um, on the empiricist side, the logical positivists felt that they were responding to the Neo-Kantians, and really favouring some of the writings of Russell on the external world, and his concept, conception of construction via abstraction from a collection of sort of small data points. Carnap's thesis, Der Raum, written in 1912 in Jena, was on the subject of Kantian and Hilbertian spaces, and was written under Bauch of the Marburg School of Neo-Kantianism. Despite their scientism, scientism, I'm not quite sure exactly what, uh, what I should use there, the Vienna Circle was always an intellectual group, though, who sought to aid science through philosophy. And to be honest, it's slightly unfair to divide the parts of logical positivism into the logical and the empirical, but it just helps me a bit to point out really how logical positivism continues with the same broad philosophical outlook as Frege and Russell. The anti-Kantianism, the anti-Hegelianism is fairly clear. So too is the respect for the Enlightenment and the empirical foundationalism of someone like Bacon, but expressing the same discontents as that of Comte with the achievements of the Enlightenment science. Indeed, the name positivism logical positivism is seemingly a very open expression of admiration for Comte. <coughs> Ludwig Wittgenstein is, in my opinion, much less controversially someone who takes up the problems of the first wave of analytic philosophy. Inspired to start by Frege and a student of Russell in Cambridge, Wittgenstein's first and only work published in his lifetime, the Tractatus, was seen by him as a really a completion 
of the philosophy that he felt he'd been taught at Cambridge and by Frege, indeed, who he met as a young man thinking about studying philosophy. Aside from their indebtedness to Frege and Russell, the Vienna Circle also owed so much to the Enlightenment directly. Carnap's early work, The Logical Structure of the World, attempted very definitely to set out the plan for the reconstruction or for the construction of a logical um, architecture of concepts built on the foundation of direct empirical evidence, much like that of Enlightenment science. One can't even easily distinguish the first and the second wave based on the politics of the people who participated in them, in some cases, although I'm not going to hold too tight onto that point. The Vienna Circle's involvement with the left is, is fairly well documented, as many of them were in youth groups and socialist parties and communist parties, and Wittgenstein apparently even tried to move to the USSR once, but he didn't. Um, yeah. But Russell also identified as a socialist for some time, Although he came to dislike Lenin after a meeting in 1920, I suppose he found Lenin's, um, I suppose Lenin found the often bloody peasant revolts a bit too funny for Russell's British sensibilities. <laughs> Despite all these similarities, which I'm hoping to stress, there were of course academic disagreements, and the growing number of fields started developing with increasing, it seems, independence. Michael Dummett, um, who held the highest chair of philosophy at Oxford in the 80s, said that when he was, in a student at, he was a student in Oxford at the end of the 40s, the enemy was Carnap. So, analytic philosophy was, was not just logical positivism. Nor Wittgenstein, nor logic, nor a linguistic turn, nor even anti-metaphysics. Wittgenstein certainly wasn't always anti-metaphysics. I think the most clear case is in the Tractatus, but after that it's really not very clear at all that he doesn't like metaphysics. In 1930, Wittgenstein wrote some remarks on James Fraser's Golden Bough, which was a deeply influential book for European literature, written in 1890. And in the book it's sort of a, a comparative study of religion and mythology. A strange choice for an analytic philosopher to analyse. So to quote from that book, or the remarks from, from Wittgenstein on that book. I now believe that it would be right to begin my book with remarks on metaphysics as a kind of magic, where in doing so, however, I must neither speak out for magic nor ridicule it. The depth of magic ought to be preserved. Yes, here cancelling out magic has the character of magic itself. For when I began earlier, i.e. in a prior work, I guess the Tractatus, to speak about the world, and not of this tree or table. What else was I attempting than to conjure up something higher in my words? And indeed, also Carnap and the Vienna Circle came to adopt a principle of tolerance towards metaphysics in around 1932, taking it as a sort of personal structural linguistic choice that shouldn't be condemned. So, why am I expressing all this doubt about a unified analytic project? Well, the second wave, what I've been calling the second wave, comes to an end. I decided it, it must come to an end. Um, the period of logical empiricist and British linguistic philosophical dominance, which I suppose really is the heart of the second wave, came to an end seemingly in the 50s. Logical positivism appeared to break down into so many dispersed projects that it simply couldn't maintain itself with the same unity that it had in Vienna in the 20s and 30s. And indeed, the logicist project broke down in the beginning of 1930 with the results of uh, Kurt Gödel, who was in the Vienna Circle in some sense. Um, in 1951, of course, also Wittgenstein dies, and although he leaves a trail of obsessed scholars, his thought had really in the end become self-critical, and this pushed it to the boundary of what was acceptably considered analytic. And this is something I'll, I'll come to a bit later about to what extent analytic can be self-critical. So, someone or something had to fill the void left by these two movements. And I suppose it would have to be a philosophy, um, in my mind, that could continue with the same strength that Frege and Russell had expressed in 1893 and 1912, the same strength and support for that sort of enlightenment kind of thought that hoped to transcend it with these new logical scientific um, structures. 
But from today's perspective, no one really did fill that void. This period is often referred to, this period just uh, after the 50s or starting sometime in the 50s, is often referred to by analytic philosophers themselves as the crisis of analytic philosophy. Um, some have even suggested that nothing that came after really should be called analytic philosophy. Apparently someone even tried to start a post-analytic philosophy um, department in Brighton, but I heard it closed fairly quickly. I see this sort of I see this period of crisis as an expression of the lack of consciousness amongst analytic philosophers or those who would still who were still being called analytic philosophers a lack of a consciousness amongst them of the reasons for which Frege and Russell carried out their philosophies and as such Carnap and Wittgenstein too the breadth and specificity of analytic philosophy which was possible because the lack of a generally accepted conditions of meaning, and yet also demanded by its scientific character, this, seemed to, this spread seemed to lead to a general forgetting of motivation, another form of enlightened thought throwing itself onto the rocks. And yet, and yet, the 60s, 70s and 80s, no doubt, I think, in volume, produced more analytic philosophy than ever before. The analytic philosophers of the 60s, 70s and 80s are of all sorts. Kantians, Hegelians, Platonists and Aristotelians. Some analytic philosophers even started doing Marxism. Analytical Marxism, which attempted to reform Marxist categories with analytic methods, or as I prefer to understand it, attempted to reform an apparently apolitical analytic philosophy with Marxist flair, has its heyday in the 70s and 80s in the midst of this crisis of analytic philosophy. In many ways, the analyticness, as I have expressed it, of analytical Marxism is in fact unclear or at least confused. For one thing, the analytical Marxists focused on individual motivations in their game-theoretic updates to Marx, they therefore distanced themselves quite clearly from some of the more structural obsessions of Frege, Russell and the Vienna Circle. And if we are to refer back to sort of the old Enlightenment thinkers and sociologists, they end up seeming much more like Locke and Mandeville than Comte. And that's actually something which uh, another person is going to mention. Here. It's actually a point of Anthony Montero. He's going to come up in a sec. Before I address analytic philosophy today which I, I do want to do, I want to take a look at some of the more recent writings on the left about analytical Marxism and analytic philosophy. The figure on the left that has been at the front of my mind for this teaching is Anthony Montero. Anthony Montero is an organiser for the Saturday Free School for Philosophy and Black Liberation in Philadelphia and it sort of runs educational programmes and reading groups. I'm hoping to educate people who otherwise could not get sort of the right revolutionary teachings in the universities. As a young civil rights activist, Montero read Das Kapital with Fred Hampton of the, Black Camp of the Black Panthers. And in the October issue of the PR, we published an article by Montero, October this year, we published an article by him on analytical Marxism. Ben Burgess is another figure on my mind. He's a columnist for Jacobin, one of the most circulated magazines on the left, and a friend of the DSA, the Jacobin. Burgess. Burgess, who's written 195 articles for them, is seemingly the in-house philosopher, I've, I've been told. And his education was in analytic philosophy, and indeed, I think he's still somewhat of a professor, although I'm not sure exactly. It says adjunct professor, but I don't know what that means. It sounds like a temp. Um, these figures, Anthony or Montero and Burgess, harbour two main attitudes towards analytic philosophy, and I think these are sort of widespread to some degree, I imagine, on the left that considers analytic philosophy. Anthony Montero is, in my opinion, seems opposed to analytic philosophy. I take it through his opposition to analytical Marxism and the seeming um, inability for the, the analytical Marxists to, to really get a grip on Marxism. Burgess, on the contrary, defends analytic philosoph philosophical meth methodologies. 
And there is sort of one more attitude which I think one could have about analytic philosophy and its relation to Marxism today. And this, um, this is one of deflation. That sort of analytic philosophy has, has no relevance to Marxism, that its methodologies um, shouldn't really be taken so, so seriously. And this was expressed by another article in the recent PR, if you're interested to have a look, by Tom Connell. Um, and it's sort of a response to the Montero article. But I don't think anyone needs to have read them to, yeah, to get a grip, hopefully, of what I'm going to say. So out of all three, these sort of three strategies, you know, um, opposition, defence and deflation, I feel most sympathetic to Tom Connell, so the deflationary one. But I'm not really in complete agreement with Tom. I think the gist of Connell's article is that, to quote, the methods of analytic philosophy are valid within certain parameters, and to ignore this validity would be intellectually and politically damaging for Marxism. So I imagine, you know, the way I'm thinking about it is Tom thinks that, well, why should we stop, you know, like, doing some basic logic, just as much as it's useful to know some basic arithmetic. Um, right. So, but given the history of analytic philosophy, which I've just discussed, this attitude sim simply seems not to respect the initial revolutionary outlook of the analytic program. I understand Canal's point, I think, but I don't feel that Montero, in his criticism of analytical Marxism, is saying that we shouldn't use logic or basic arithmetic. If there's a fear in Montero, it's that analytical Marxism is going to take over from some genuine Marxism, and I would say that it's not primarily analytical Marxism. In that case, if that is really Montero's fear, it's not really analytical Marxism that should have stoked his fears of the left losing intellectuals. Um, Montero concludes his article saying that the future of analytical Marxism is a part of AI, uh, modal logic, and game theory, and against the working class. And I would say to him, those things are doing pretty well without analytic Marxism. I think... I think the best version of Cannell's point is that the critique of philosophy and of analytic philosophy was never one of wrong thinking. It was about the limits of philosophy as thought, you know, thinking back to those passages at the beginning. The limits of philosophy as thought turned in on itself. Burgess and Montero as supporter and critic, respectively, both make of Marxism something to be refuted by analytic philosophy they show some forgetting that Marxism wasn't really about being right, it was about upholding the theoretical side of the struggle for socialism. It was about upholding the dialectic. The disagreement I have with Cannell concerns the... Or, <laughs> concerns the... Uh, the disagreement I have with Cannell concerns the origin of analytical Marxism. There are two narratives I've come across about significant, the significant intellectual origins of analytical Marxism, or at least the causes of it. One is that it's the intellectual product of neoliberalism. The other is that it's the intellectual flip side of Stalinism. Of course, the narrative I've told about the motivations for the, uh, for the early analytic philosophers is substantially different. It's about the falling apart of Enlightenment values, or at least the lack of the sort of, in the crisis of analytic philosophy, of a grasp on those values. I hope to have shown how the analytical Marxism of the 70s and 80s was, Stalinism and neoliberalism aside, I don't want to dismiss them, but I want to say how that analytical Marxism was part of a crisis of philosophy, which Marx more specifically, and more specifically Adorno's writings, already knew. For Adorno, logical positivism, and any new Enlightenment project were already symptoms of a crisis. Analytical Marxism was not necessary for a critique of analytic philosophy. And I suppose in the end I can't say for sure whether Montero or Connell would agree here, um, but I think that that warrants raising the point. On my account, analytical Marxism, as well as contemporary pure formal logic, can be regressive aspects of analytic philosophy. So both the analytical Marxism and these sorts of highly respected on both accounts, like sort of logical methods to some degree. Um, but I'm not sure this holds for Montero and Cannell. Montero says, neo-positivist, I guess that's sort of like a sly joke about 
Logical positivism? I don't know. <laughs> Neo-positivist methods, epistemologies, and logics are the foundation of analytical Marxism. I agree. He goes on. Analytical Marxism is an effort to salvage what can be salvaged of neo-positivism. I disagree. Analytic Marxism sought to shift analytic philosophy, in my opinion, just as much as it sought to shift Marxism. I'm sure Russell or Carnap were creative enough to come up with the idea of analytical Marxism, but they didn't do it. And I think that's telling. So, this is... Yeah. So, analytic philosophy today. Adorno recognised the kernel of truth in the analytic tradition. To quote from the opening essay of Adorno and Horkheimer's Dialectic of Enlightenment, Enlightenment understood in the widest sense as the advance of thought, as always aimed at liberating human beings from fear and installing them as masters. But of course, the wholly enlightened earth is radiant with triumphant calamity. Today, when Bacon's utopia, in which we should command nature in action, has been fulfilled on a telluric scale, the essence of the compulsion which he ascribed to unmastered nature is becoming apparent. It was power itself. Knowledge, in which, for Bacon, the sovereignty of man unquestionably lay hidden, can now devote itself to dissolving that power. But in face of this possibility, enlightenment in the service of the present is turning itself into an outright deception of the masses. So, this was the state of the Enlightenment, or the fate, but philosophy did not have to identify itself with the Enlightenment. There was always hope for a self-conscious philosophy, as I've already mentioned, a philosophy that was permeated with the potential of what could be different, that could confront its own deficiencies, even if it could not overcome them. This potential seemed to lie, for Adorno, in analytic philosophy just as much, I think, as any. If I'm to suggest one thing about analytic philosophy today, something slightly new, is that perhaps it may not harbour that potential anymore. Analytic philosophy is, it seems, has always been essentially opposed to studying its own history. The point is relatively easy to convey. Consider the question of what philosophy is. This is a base, a philosophical question. However, the question of what analytic philosophy is is not a question of analytic philosophy. It's hard to say um, the extent to which such a question was blocked or tabooed within analytic philosophy before its crisis. Russell and Wittgenstein had no troubles addressing metaphilosophical questions, but it's really only after the crisis that there are somewhat popular and extensive attempts to address such questions. These attempts are, though, broadly dismissed, merely considered a sort of intrigue. If it was always uninterested in itself, analytic philosophy may have become, in its crisis, self-consciously uninterested in itself and in its history. Why Still Philosophy by Adorno ends as follows. Whatever wants nothing to do with the trajectory of history belongs all the more truly to it. History promises no salvation and offers the possibility of hope only to the concept whose movement follows history's path to the very extreme. So, in response to that, the dismissal of history by analytic philosophy consciously seems like another step away from realising any potential of becoming a self-critical philosophy. Ask any analytic philosophy philosopher today, and my bet would be that they'll say that the story of analytic philosophy is one of success. The number of its sub-disciplines has grown massively. There's something for everyone to study. It associates with some of the richest and most powerful forces of our moment, most notably recently Sang Bankman Fried and the whole um, uh, what is it called? Effective Altruist movement, which is sort of like analytic ethics. Um, but philosophically, the story seems to me to be one of disharmony and ambivalence. Wittgenstein apparently said in a lecture on mathematics that, quote, if you can show that there are numbers bigger than the infinite, your head whirls. This may be the chief reason that this was invented. I get such a feeling about analytic philosophy today. They hope, in some sense, to become nothing, or the same thing, to simply reconstitute what there already is. I suppose the question is whether they can really do that. Their history may be imminent within their practices and their concepts, as I, as I hope to have sort of described, 
But maybe they really can just do logic, as you or I may do puzzles in the back pages of a newspaper on the train to work. So, last page now. I suppose a question that might remain for me to deal with is why deal with philosophy? And more specifically, in what way does any consideration of philosophy serve the project to build a genuinely revolutionary Marxian left? I have purposefully left this question uh, until the end. On discussing philosophy in casual yet politically charged settings, I have in some cases found it a useful strategy that I qualify the conversation by expressing some light-hearted self-hatred. To apologise for my own insurmountable tendency to become a dead, middle-class white man is an act of self-criticism that usually affects about enough endorsement so as to allow me to continue talking about philosophy <laughs> without arousing too much suspicion. But I hope that I would be lying, or but I suppose that I would be lying if I did not myself think that an apology was due to some extent for my discussing philosophy. I wish perhaps that such a discussion did not need to be had, even though I may enjoy it. One reason one might want to engage in philosophy is because the left do, as Montero and Burgess do, um, and Canal. Because philosophy touches some kind of wound on the left that elicits all sorts of weird reactions, and in order to deal with those wounds, one might want to bring it up. But this, I suppose, in the end, does seem slightly like a cop-out. Perhaps, you know, another answer would be, I engage philosophy because the left have in the past engaged it, Adorno and Marx. But I think that's an equally evasive answer. I think really the point is that philosophy did have some special quality that appeared to leave it somewhat able to more honestly reflect on reality, and as such was seemingly a refuge for freedom of some kind. Much like art, which also deals in things that have no immediate purpose, which cannot be fully measured by bourgeois social relations. And it is such refuges that I think um, could be of interest to us who wish to reconstitute a genuinely revolutionary politics. To quote from The Ends of Philosophy by Chris Catrone, Engaging philosophy is not being told how to think, but allowing one's thinking to be challenged and tasked in a specific way. It is a microcosm of how society challenges and tasks our thinking, whether we are inclined to it or not. Marx reminds us, man makes history, but not according to conditions of his own choosing. Platypus does not stand above the left in any way. Platypus does not offer special knowledge to the left, although we may understand Marxism more than some parts of the left. Nor are we immune to the present death of the left, as we say in Platypus. Platypus is a symptom of that death. The aim of the teaching was not to repeat what Marxists have said about philosophy, although I hope to have rehashed what has been said, the aim of the teaching was to consider how analytic philosophy has been obscured in history. What might that say about the left? I don't doubt that my account may have rubbed some people the wrong way. In fact, I rather hope it has. But I do hope that I've considered the way in which philosophy has tasked us. Thank you. So, straight on to Q&A. Uh, yeah, in the back. Hi. Um, yeah, thanks very much uh, for the presentation. Um, one, the one thing that's still very unclear to me is the point of departure of analytic philosophy towards Hegelian dialectics or Kant's speculative reason, or, you know, if, if you could go further into the critique that analytic philosophers have of that tradition or the... Yeah, why they believe that is not no longer adequate, or never was adequate. I'm not sure. Right. I mean, I don't think I, I don't know if I could reproduce specifically any like reasons as to why Frege and and Russell. You know, I think they feel in many ways that they're reacting more to like a, you know, the real formal the lack of really good formal uh, systems at the time. Um, so it seems like to them that nothing's really improved since Aristotle, I think. Um, but I think that's telling in the way that it, you know, even that the fact that it appeared to them, that sort of Hegelian dialectical logic 
was 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 insufficient is is telling i think about uh, i think it says it says a lot about that seems like a symptom an interesting symptom i don't know if i can give like very good reasons like i mean uh, russell's engagement with hegel i don't know too much about his hegelianism i know like at first he was sort of neo hegelian but then he joined more in criticisms of uh, of bradley the sort of sort of british idealist at the time um and I think, you know, there's, there's a really good argument that Bradley, like, really fucks up Hegel. Um, and so maybe they just didn't understand him at all in the first place. And I'm sure there's still uh, arguments to be made in any case that they don't. Um, so what do you mean by systems when you say that they thought that the systems weren't sufficiently logical? Well, in a very basic sense, like, they, like, Frege specifically introduced some new, like, formal, I don't know what even the word would be, but like formal tools, like which allowed them to express sentences and meanings which we use every day in common language, namely like the quantifier is like the really big discovery of Frege apparently, which allowed them to move beyond like previous logic had almost always engaged only um, with the most basic unit as the proposition. Whereas Frege introduced like the ability to talk about concepts and objects falling in under them and then with the quantifier they could then talk about like how many objects or how many concepts are there and so in that sense it's like more expressively powerful like without Frege and Russell I think uh, like modern programming would would I don't know it would have risen differently like for sure I think um, yeah is that okay well, yeah. thanks I mean, just um, off that, um, it seems like a lot of times the crit critique of Hegel, especially in the early Russell, um, is about the category of meaning, right? It's not, he, it's not meaningful what Hegel is saying. It doesn't have a meaning in, in reality, which um, so sort of suggests a disconnect between the philosophy and the world. Would you agree with that? And, and, that, and if so, why? Why would it? Why would it appear to us in that way? Did he just misunderstand Hegel? Or? I think, that, yeah, maybe that's part of what I was trying to get in my beginning answer to the first question, is that maybe, you know, it's not, like, irrational for Russell and uh, Frege to suddenly think that uh, Hegel's insufficient or something like this. Like, maybe they have really good concrete reasons for just not getting along with Hegel. And, you know, his, 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 you know, very much a lot of confidence in his dialectic. And um, I think maybe that just, maybe you could say that, well, because they're sort of reaching back, in any case, to like the Enlightenment, they're going like back before Hegel, no doubt, like, it seems uh, incomprehensible to them or some way insufficient. Something like that. Um, yeah. And I guess, like, this sort of problem of meaning is something that also the second wave take up again in relation to, to Heidegger most specifically, but I'm sure they would have raised the same um, issues with Hegel, that they just think he's not speaking sense. Um, yeah, and I think I'd go to the same explanation there, that, like, maybe there's a reasonable uh, explanation for it just passing over them. Hello. Yeah. Um, I have sort of a just like a comment or like a thought I'm having, and maybe you can respond to that. Um, some things you I think didn't really mention, but that I sort of associate with analytic philosophy um, is kind of like analytic, analytic philosophy is like the highest stage of reification. So in a way, like Marx already like in his, in Capital, like there's this famous um, phrase where he says like. In cap I don't know, in capitalism or in bourgeois society, yep. uh, there's freedom, equality, property, and bantam. And bantam? Yes, bantam. For like <laughs> utilitarianism. Oh, bantam. As like a... <laughs> no, no, Jeremy bantam. Oh, bantam. Oh, right, right. Yep, so yep. like uh, where he already sort of kind of connects um, this utilitarian yep. way of thinking or approach to ethics or like 
yeah. political life to sort of um, yeah bourgeois social relations. And I had to think of that when you mentioned the effect of altruism, right? Right. Um, and I, um, I mean, I, I don't know, but I, I don't think I have so much more to like to add to this, but it just that I think that the category of reification is really useful right. uh, also to think when to think of mm. analytic philosophy, which generally through their la language approach always try to understand things in and of themselves as like a right. A single atom, um, like the atom justice, the atom morality, all these categories as like single units. Right. Uh, I mean, maybe it's a bit uh, rough uh, mm. characterization, but um, no, no. this is like one way I think of it. And just like um, some couple more sentences, why I think this is like interesting is because or, like because I I wonder if sometimes also this thought um, is attractive today maybe because uh, or like because it sort of gives a certain sense of um, rationality um, in the way that you know maybe like connecting it to the left that the left right. is, <clears throat> since the left is also um, not powerful it sort of sometimes might seem attractive to have something like analytical Marxism, where you sort of can feel more secure in having all rational without sort of the woozy dialectics. Yeah. And um, because the left is also actually not powerful, and um, can uh, can be so self confident in their thinking as they were, and so. Political Marxism might seem like an easy way to to sound less uh, naive, to sound less like a naive revolutionary um, Hegelian right. voodoo thinker. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe it could be that. Yeah. Well, I guess. Uh, Just like it's a symptom of insecurity, yeah. also. Yeah. I guess it's a symptom of insecurity. Yeah, I guess you know, really, if you understand, if you think of like analytic Marxism as the people who wanted to sound less crazy by going to like the accepted analytic tradition which was very well defined that sounds already quite bad doesn't it it's like well of course things are going to go wrong if you're going to like change the basis of marxist categories to like the philosophy of science like of the science like the philosophy that really like um really like belittles itself in the face of facts like the facts the given um but you're right i didn't i didn't address like reification so so much in the talk i think that would have been a difficult one to like break down through the different stages of uh of analytic philosophy at least the ones that i, I came up with but i think like the obsession with meaning um in analytic philosophy that I, that I guess speaks to this, right? You know, what's what 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 concepts are meaningful? What, which ones are defined based on accepted data and rigorously logically defined um, bases? Then, then in that sense, I I guess so. If anything. I guess the, what I've called the crisis of, of Marxism, they still continue to deal with meaning. In fact, they probably deal with meaning in the sense that we think about it much more than, than ever did, in some sense, logical positivists and and Frege and Russell. Like, it's really like the discussion between um, a bunch of Americans, like Quine and um, Donald Davidson and Hilary Putnam and Chomsky as well, who, like, starts, I think, in Cambridge, right? Um, that really bring meaning, I think, as we usually discuss it in philosophy, into the conversation. So, yeah. But I think, yeah, I mean, the, the sort of worry I expressed at the end of the, at the end of the teaching, like about, well, okay, I posed the question in the preamble, maybe Adorno's hypothesis has been, like, falsified in some sense, in some way, by analytic philosophy. Like, um, maybe actually there's no hope for, like, a critical 
philosophy to arise of out of analytic philosophy because maybe it's just become like puzzle solving or like um, people doing some hard logic because it feels really great when you solve a hard logical question which which then would just seem to like be the complete absorption of philosophy into the present because it because then it would make no effect on anything just as much as you know you know doing puzzle doing a crossword isn't revolutionary like, can never be revolutionary um, uh, yeah. Thanks. Maybe to respond to the reification thing, um, I don't think it's so much about an analytic philosophy being reified or using reified categories. I don't think it's any less reified than, say, contemporary Hegelianism or anything, or, or even Marxism. Um, but rather, maybe one could frame it in a way that philosophy itself, philosophy as philosophy, after the collapse of Hegelianism becomes reified in the sense that becomes reified as a discipline in the sense that it appears untimely and it's uh, lost its sort of all-encompassing and powerful uh, place in intellectual culture, but still people hold on to it for some necessary reason. And so it's, it's like it's it's fragmented into ethics and logics and right. uh, you know, philosophy of religion and there's no all-encompassing attempt anymore, right? The first sort of, the big, right. I don't know, um, post-Hegelian philosophers like Kierkegaard and Nietzsche are very fragmented thinkers. Um, and so analytic philosophy is part of that fragmentation which sort of knows and concedes that philosophy is useless <laughs> but still holds on to it in a very weird way. Right. What would you say would be the necessary reason to hold on philosophy after its loss of this encompassing capability? That was going to be one of my questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I, I'd say, like in very obvious ways, like analytic philosophy, uh, like many of the branches of it have become very much integrated into like more direct or into like sciences. So. Um, I was doing a master's in logic and philosophy of science and a lot of people would specialize there in like AI and uh, machine learning and the ethics of AI. And then I know a few of them went on to do like master's in uh, machine learning. And then I assume they'll get a very nice job somewhere in the future. So, I mean, like in the basic, in the sense that analytic philosophy um, really loves science, then it's become very much like necessary just as much as scientific practice in capitalism is necessary and development progress um, and seemingly the more theoretical disciplines like are now really earning their their place because you know people need someone who knows about AI somewhere but why do you think as a sort of intellectual tradition it wants us why do people not shut up talking about Hegel and Kant and fucking Aristotle? About them, yeah. not analytic philosophy. Yeah, just yeah, philosophy in general. Right. Well, I guess the point would be from the end of the talk is that like philosophy, even even in its uh, like the way Adorno puts it, right, is that even in like it's necessary necessarily crippling a uh, state, a crippled state, like it can never really be practice, it can never be socialism, um, it still might have a role to form this sort of, this way of thinking that is critical of society. And, uh, and that would be a good argument, I think, for like, why people might still talk about Kant and, and Hegel and everyone, but I don't think that that would hold up. I think the question I was raising is maybe that doesn't hold up anymore for some parts of analytic philosophy. Like, if I start to talk to a friend about um, some recent discovery in logic, I don't seem to be like having a sort of weird intellectual spasm as I do when I like, start talking about dialectics. You know, I think that's a strange one. Yeah. Um, but but on another side of the necessity, obviously, like there was this, um, there was this big, not big thing, but like Sam Bankman-Fried, right, the guy who uh, 
what was it called again? What's the, yeah, anyway, the, the, the crypto guy. And he, he was purportedly like a big effective altruist or he donated like lots and lots of money to effective altruism. And in that sense, effective altruism like fulfilled like a really great psychological need of like a capitalist to just like say that I'm a really good guy <laughs> and so you could trust me and so I can continue doing business. So it fulfilled a very great need there, I'd say. And... In many ways, lots of other of the analytic disciplines I feel fulfill the same role of like ego boosting in some cases. Like uh, I know Anthony Montero thinks that uh, that analytical Marxism was a great a great expression of um, the way in which like the 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 academy just needs to like keep going, and it was like oh great we've got another thing to do analytical Marxism that'll that'll get us some books, and. Um, I didn't like that point so much because I, I felt like, but I guess at that time, I didn't know if it was really enough to just say, in some sense, which in some sense he's saying that people do philosophy because they're greedy or something like this. They just want academic success. I didn't. I didn't feel like that was wholly true, for that moment. I don't know. It just felt a bit too um, shallow. I thought. Not not shallow, but like didn't really seem to get to the crux of the issue. Well, the way you framed it in the teaching was that it's not so much mu about Marxism or the left reaching for analytic philosophy, but rather analytic philosophy reaching for Marxism. What? Can you yeah. On that? Yeah. Right. There was a point. Yeah, I think that was. If anything, if my my if if the main part of the reading group in terms of the teaching in terms of its engagement with the left was about this Montero and this Canal paper, it was really an attempt to like. Um, so the way they got a handle on analytical Marxism was, oh, it was this um, response to neoliberalism. It was like the neoliberalist equivalent in the academy. Um, and I felt like that that was untrue um, because I didn't feel like analytical m Marxism was just sort of like, had just sort of come out of nowhere like that. And I, I wasn't trying to say they're wrong, I wasn't. I didn't want to say that. Like, no, those, those um, political events, they didn't have like, they, they had some effect, I think. But I felt like I wanted to get like the other handle on it, going through the history of analytic philosophy and how it's not actually. It doesn't actually make sense from an analytical philosophical perspective, and in, in some way, like it's it's actually perhaps an expression not of like analytic philosophy applied to Marxism, but of like what happened when analytic philosophy broke down such that people could actually suddenly start doing anal analytical Marxism. Because I, I said, I don't think... I think Russell and Carnap, probably Carnap mostly, you know, he was a bit more radical when he was younger politically. But I feel like the the idea would have come to his head. I, feel, I just feel like it would be too naive to say that Carnap couldn't have thought of, like, rehashing Marx's principles in terms of, like... Um, the empirical and logical content and con concepts like that, I think he could. I think he probably did, but I think he thought it would have been a sh would have been a bad idea. Um, yeah, and I think he thought it wouldn't have been true to as I think analytical Marxism was wouldn't have been true to Marxism or analytic philosophy. I think the the young or like the early analytic philosophers were more radical, true to themselves in the whole language thing, so as that they generally kept away from like ethics and politics um at least that was my impression like in, in the yeah. philosophy yeah yeah philosophy. right whereas like nowadays this is like yeah um and i mean that's personally where i think actually more of the um problematic uh, maybe aspects are in analytic philosophy when they start doing ethics and right. ethical philosophy because then that's when like effective altruism and this kind of stuff which i think is like a real ideological like phenomenon in society um, gets like rationalized and le legitimized by this. Mm. this well, thing. I think some of the early analytic philosophers they did do ethics, right? Like, I mean, the best case would be like Moore, you know, G. E. Moore, who has like a couple of famous cracks. I haven't, haven't, don't think I've gone too deep into them. What's it called again? Like about a uh, pretty good ethic and like the whole. Uh, 
value, kind of like a fact value distinction or something, like moral properties and not factual properties, this sort of thing. And then logical positivists also have like stuff on ethics, but it's very small. Mostly, I think, Ayer, Ayer, who talks about like emotivism. But you're right. I think you're right, definitely, that ethics doesn't really become a big thing until, like, in my mind, like, as in... The, the modern form of ethics is, is definitely very crazy. But, I mean, there were, there were, older, there were older people writing like this, like Sedgwick and... Um, but then I guess the bigger ones I think of are like, yeah, they're all people who sort of, yeah, writing through the 60s, 70s, 80s, and then, yeah, today. But I think the, I, it's hard for me to have a gauge on to what it, to how big some of these um, movements are, just because I, I, yeah, I never, never studied ethics in an analytical philosophy department, or like as part of a course, but there is like analytic ethics, and it, it does, you know, come to problems in very much an analytic way, in the same way, like trying to break down concepts into their constituent parts, um, like the whole, the whole Morian uh, idea of like, oh, there's a, there's a moral um, concept or um, a concept which has moral value, and then we have all the concepts which only have like empirical value, and clearly the moral one is very different. That already is like, um, yeah, clearly a very analytic way of doing it. Yeah. Alistair McIntyre. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Alistair McIntyre. Alistair McIntyre, right? The um, yeah, energy yeah. ethics guy. He used to be a Trotskyist. And that. he turned to analytic Aristotelianism because he thought Marxism lacked in ethics. Oh, right. Yeah. Could you maybe, I think, thanks for the no, talk. Um, could you maybe say a bit more about like the, the politics of analytic Marxism? Um, like, I, I, I don't know a lot, but right. like, how do those people like um, understand the relationship between like I don't know, Marxism and politics? What is or Marxism and I mean I'm, I wouldn't say I'm not a specialist on analytical mm -hmm. philosophy. Yet. I mean analytical Marxism, and my engagement is pretty much reduced to um, those two articles on the PR, and then actually Montero's article, kind of interestingly, he wrote it originally in like 1992. But he edited it and sent it into the PR. I don't know <laughs> why I did that. I, I don't know, like, <laughs> so what do you say, like a guy like Ben Burgess? But how, in, does, how does he right. understand uh, the relationship between like I don't know, philosophy, Marxism, and politics? I just, I don't think. I mean, I haven't read too many. I've only got one Ben Burgess article under my belt. But but I think the impression is he doesn't see like a problem. I think he just sees. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, the only thing is that the analytical Marxism Marxists have their have their analytical breakdown of Marxist concepts. The one I have in my mind, I think, is like, it's about class interest. And like one of the ways in which, well, I don't know if it's one of them or if it's the only one, they, the analytical Marxists understood this was that like class interests are like game theoretic interests of individual players in a game. And uh, if we just work out what the values of the outcomes are, and then we consider, you know, everyone's knowledge about where everyone's playing, then we can work out what the best strategy to have is politically if we want to achieve our class interests. So that's like one concrete example. I don't think they see it as a big problem. I, I don't I, I can't imagine why they would, like, they think it's, I think maybe the barrier, right, would probably come when, it, I mean, I think very consciously the analytical Marxists, a couple of them really, the sticking points would have been like dictatorship of the proletariat. I think, I don't know how they could, quant I don't know if they tried, but I can imagine that would, that would be a very hard one to, to quantify in a game theoretic sense. <laughs> yeah, but maybe they did. I think quite a few of them though called like explicitly not for revolution and like, very much had um, reformist outlooks. Mm -hmm. And so Marxism um, is more of like a framework um, for analysis um, and like maybe a good framework which shows uh, like, yeah. which correctly shows like the interests of people, but nothing more than that. 
like you would like like when if you. What are you thinking when you say nothing more than that? Like I don't know, like because it like, the way you tell it, it sounds like um, like it makes sense that a category like revolution would be outside of such categories because it proposes a philosophy of history in a way. It presupposes a mm. philosophy of history in a way. It presupposes that you think about change and and in, inside of that framework. It seems very presentistic, if that makes sense. Um, where, where, where we analyze, mm. we, we can analyze the present with the help of Marxist categories, um, but that is actually just the, like that's the aim, um, analyzing, yeah. and then maybe through that we can. Well, I think I mean they yeah. probably had this idea that mm -hmm. oh, you know these are our real interests, mm -hmm. and then when we do the whole game theoretic analysis we come out with like what we should do if I'm to fulfill my interests but yeah the necessity of that choice is I think on that point very unclear like mm -hmm. what's the real you know you have your interest but why fulfill your interest something like this and um, I think they are also gonna they get, they get rid of all the, the whole teleological mm -hmm. um, aspect of or well, not teleological yeah, I don't know you yeah, know Marxism and, like the sense of the beyond the yardsticks that are given to us in in capitalism, I think it's I can I, just, I wouldn't I wouldn't know, but I can imagine that they just can't come up with that in a game theoretic sense mm -hmm. or in any of these rationally reconstructed um, Marxist categories, Quant quantification like quantified, kind of quantified them, and I think like one of the points in the in the that essay by. Adorn and Horkheimer on the concept of enlightenment is that like when one reduces everything to a number or like the value of a variable in advance the possibilities are reduced to like an infinite level or something to an infinite degree yeah got one back yeah um, yeah could you speak more to how analytic analytic philosophy and also analytic Marxism deals with the with with contradiction? Do they make it a category, or does it not exist for them? Or I I can't speak to how they deal with it personally, but I mean I think um to to talk maybe a bit about contradiction in analytic philosophy as a whole, like in the Phrygian and and Russellian logical structures. They think that they both have the principle of like excluded or the uh, ex falso quad libre. Or... Like if there's a contradiction, everything yeah. follows. Thus, contradictions are like completely unacceptable for us yeah. logically. And that continues. This 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 um, this axiom within my classical logic continues for a long time. And indeed, it's it's just part of classical logic. But but analytic philosophers started to do lots of different logics. You know, they started to take out that principle and then make demands on on uh, the form of sentences that that made it not so bad that you could have contradictions but they wouldn't lead to like yeah explosions um, and so I you know I guess the point is let's say I guess the point is ultimately that even when you expand your understanding of what's possible in, lo in a logical sense if you include things that seemingly have always been unacceptable for logic, if you continue to go about it in a way that will always only accept one logic's verdict on it, mm. then you seemingly you fall into the same trap of, of reducing the possibilities of understanding, in some sense. Like, dialectical logic, right, pushes from... Um, from one state to to another completely sort of alien to it and it only indicated negatively and I think that's like I mean I know I know some people are trying to, to formalize um, the alien logic but I don't know anything about it I haven't done category theory and that's very important for it I don't know if anyone else has yeah but so, so to, to the analytical Marxist understanding of contradictions, like contradictions in society, I think that would just may, maybe I can't, I can't say, but maybe it would be something like, um, you know, in uh, in like a 
game theoretic sense, like a Nash equilibrium, is where if everyone acts with the best in the best sense, um, that like they they might end up with a suboptimal strategy or something like this. Like in the prisoner's dilemma, right? Maybe that would be like the contradictions for the analytic Marxists. Like everyone acts in the most rational way and achieves like a suboptimal result. So or like something a like this. Uh, is that another? I don't know. I mean, the prisoner's dilemma was like the case where we have two prisoners, prisoners, and they're being interviewed as to whether they're guilty. And there's like a bargain, like if you rat on your friend, um, you'll get like a reduced sentence. Um, if they don't rat on you, if you both rat on each other, you'll both get like big sentences and if neither rats and anyone you'll both like go free and the optimal solution is actually to rat on your friend because in both scenarios it's just better if they don't rat on you then you'll go completely free if they do then you should rat on them and so it becomes like a point where for everyone it's so optimal to act rationally something like this and i can imagine that that's that's how they would break it down something like this like contradictions are things to be worked through if we sort of reform and and really realize the best strategy is for society as a whole or something like this I can imagine but yeah, yeah. Uh, Max you had a question earlier yeah what it was about uh, um, <coughs> I think I, I wanted to make a comment about geocon and analytic Marxism but never mind about that um, um no, yeah, when, I was going to ask, don't you think Anthony Montero has a, has a point in associating analytical Marxism with the advent of neoliberalism? Like, um, yeah. Yeah, to, to put it polemically, you could summarize Gio Cohen by saying um, there's no such thing as society, there's only individuals and modes of production. That's like, basically his philosophy of history. Right. right. Yeah, I, I think I think I didn't want my teaching to, in some sense, oppose that perspective. I just wanted to say that maybe, like, we shouldn't all put it down to like upholding analytic principles in the Marxist sphere or with respect to Marxist categories. I wanted to say that perhaps the reason why, you know, a seemingly analytic reaction to the the political events of the time could actually um, only be possible on the basis of a prior crisis of analytic philosophy. That it's, you know, the crisis that enabled the sort of freedom for analytic philosophers to then maybe react to political events um, in such a way as Cohen did. Not events, but, you know, mm. well, that was economic mean... changes and wouldn't that mean to treat analytic philosophy quite as quite isolated, which has like an imminent historical development, which has to be understood? In yeah, yeah. Itself? I think I think for sure that would be a good criticism of my teaching. I think, um, yeah, I think ideally, right? I would have attempted to understand. Yeah, I mean, I really I didn't talk about the crisis that much. If if in the teaching, right? I basically said so. People died. That's why there was a crisis, <laughs> um, and I think that's not fair. I think. I think there would have to be, yeah, a full account would definitely be to look at that point much more. Like, why did, you know, these scholars who, who, who followed Wittgenstein and, and really, you know, attempted to keep, um, keep up his thought, and why do the logical positivists in America, like, there were very much still many philosophers in America who were alive who were logical positivists in the 50s and 60s, but for some reason or other, I didn't go into it, they lost traction with within, like, philosophy. And um, the way I framed it was, like, that logical positivism or the general analytic program demanded, like, a massive spread. And it demanded, like, the, um, um, the invasion of all, all possible, like, creative, like, uh, attempts to sort of continue the analytic method, this sort of conceptual decomposition and that the spread just went too far or something, and, and suddenly the initial project, based on these sort of Enlightenment values, anti-Kant, anti-Hegel, they sort of just became so thin 
because everyone was doing different things. That was the story I gave, but I think if you yeah, the full story would have to require like an understanding of how those aren't like independent of economic and political factors, and uh, well, in fact, they're the expression of them. But uh, yeah, there's only so much time in a teaching, so. Max? Yeah. Mm -hmm. In face of that, would you say there's something Anglo Saxon about analytic philosophy? Anglo Saxon? Yeah. Like, I don't know much about Anglo Saxon <laughs> culture. In terms in, like, of. In the sense of Anglo Saxon. No, no, no. Yeah. Right, as in American English. As in, uh, not as in Blut and Boden, but as in uh, Anglo Saxon Enlightenment. Um, like, you, you very much focus on. Or you insisted that analytic philosophy marks some kind of turn uh, back to the Enlightenment in the sense of yeah. before Kant and Hegel. So Kant wouldn't be part of the Enlightenment. And Rousseau wouldn't be? Rousseau is before Kant and Hegel. Yeah, but would he be part of that Enlightenment? Which I think the, philosophy? the Enlightenment thinkers I was thinking about were like Bacon taking it from the concept of the Enlightenment, that, that Hawkeye Madonna one, and then Isaac Newton, like, Newton. and uh, the Principia. Oh, I can't remember the original name. But, I mean, R Russell and Whitehead's book, Principia Mathematica, the name is a reference to originally a work by Newton. I can't remember what it's called. Maybe it's like Philosophica Naturalis Principia Mathematica. And uh, I don't think I could speak so much to the similarities between like Newton and his method and and then Russell Frager and, and Carnap and Wittgenstein. But at least like the very shallow similarity is the form. If you look at that book, like the first like the chapters are like first few I've only read the first few chapters I think and and it's like definitions of force and and motion and space. It's like bang 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 which is like exactly the same. And so I, I think that was the main thing I have in mind, and like what exactly they were reaching about. I wasn't really only thinking of those those two people. Um, yeah. And empiricism, right? Like yeah, yeah. Hume, Locke. Yeah, I guess the the, the tension between like Newton, as like an inspiration for them, is because Newton is like actually, like quite into metaphysics. <laughs> And like the sort of view of absolute space is a metaphysical one that Kant Kant obviously takes up a lot. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm um, sorry, but the, the follow up was no. no. Well, right. I, was, I was thinking because um, obviously logical empiricism raises the question of original empiricism. Yeah. Right. Um, would you say it, it harkens back to that, and if so, successfully? Yeah, right, well, there's two names for logical positivism. There's, like, logical positivism, positivism, positivism and logical empiricism. And each of the names seems to refer to, like, two older traditions that are quite different, right? One's referring back, I feel like, it's definitely to Comte and positivism. And then empiricism, in my mind, I would associate with, like, um, Locke, uh, Mill, and Hume, the... And Hume, Hume Wright, Enlightenment, a Scottish Enlightenment thinker. Yeah. I guess, though, I think, I think Comte is the, is the... I mean, I know, I know some people, in, I know someone in Platypus who has a, a specific distaste for the name logical positivism. He finds it much um, more confusing than logical empiricism. And, uh, and I... I don't know, it would be nice, interesting to talk to him again, but I feel like the reference to Comte is very nice, because, at least the way I found it right, Comte obviously not an Enlightenment thinker, ultimately, you know, comes after Kant and Hegel. But he, he does, I, I, I was rereading a tiny bit of it for this, and, you know, he, he does express, like, great reverence for Bacon and the whole foundationalist, empirical method but he just, he kind of seemed to say in this passage, in this, this sort of chapter that I read, was was like, that was great, but Enlightenment science really, really didn't cut it. You know, 
and like that that would be like the part where Newton's like oh yeah Newton was great but you know he still was doing metaphysics and we could get rid of that and so I really felt like the Comte uh, reference makes a lot more sense after the teaching but you know I'd be open to changing my mind yeah the back um, you, you had mentioned that a lot of these um, foundational analytic philosophers were, you know, working on their philosophies at the same time as there were a lot of breakthroughs in physics on the atomic and subatomic level. And I'd be interested if there's any kind of, um, yeah, if, if you know or are aware of sort of connections between how analytic philosophers would have understood the threat to formal logic and to sort of chains of causality and so on and the whole relationship between subject and object that discoveries such as, you know, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle and, and so on created. Was, was their work in some way a reaction to that or was it independent of that, so to speak? I think I lack enough knowledge about mm -hmm. the, the improvements in like physics at the time and the relation between the thinkers. Yeah, completely. I, I fail there. Um, I mean, in relation to Frege and Russell, I can't say anything. Um, Wittgenstein, I... I mean, the relationship between those thinkers that I brought up and science seems, in my mind, to be almost exclusively related to... Um, uh, breakthroughs in mathematics. I'm sure that's not the case all the time with Russell. I'm sure Russell was probably aware of like breakthroughs in physics because he was, you know, a widely read guy. But um, when I think of Frege and and Wittgenstein specifically, and then Carnap and the Vienna Circle, and the ways in which their thought changed through time, like the, the best example is like uh, the Gödel's incompleteness theorems, which seemingly disrupted the logicist program. But but you were talking about the relation between subject and object and how that might be affected by the discoveries in physics. Did you say that? Well, that the <clears throat> observation of an object's location right. changes the object's location so that it is no longer possible to speak about the mm. object and the subject as, right, separate, right. as was the case in pre-Kantian philosophy. Right. I mean, the way, so, so I think one of the ways in which empirical science, like empirical philosophical um, work thought about, I think, um, scientific discovery in like the sort of older British empiricists was as, was as discovery, like, mm -hmm. like, um, we saw it, and then like yeah, it was showed to us. Reality was showed to us, but I think I think the the logical empiricists they they think much more of scientific discovery as like explanation. Um, that like it's any like way in which one conceptualizes reality is in fact yeah. merely just an attempt. Um, is really just like the way in which whatever theory you choose conveys to you. So I think. You know, they have initially, right, this whole thing about the given, the, the given is reality. But they really don't discuss that much later on, and I think it's because they're not afraid, but they don't want to get bound up, right, in, in metaphysics and talking about, like, what's really there um, behind it all. I think that, they think that's concept's sort of absurd. It's like, no, it's, there's no, there's no really there, it's just what, what theory you chose, what, um, linguistic structure you chose and then how that relates to um, even experience is a dodgy one <laughs> I mean, yeah they get they get away from that I think but I mean maybe this speaks to Max's point about um, seemingly individuals start to become isolated and I think I think there's definitely an argument right that that the measure of reality in the logical positivist's view of science is is very much like perhaps down to the individual. But then they have all their like like sort of dislike for they they think of science as like a, a social practice in, in some way. Like they think like the structures 
with which we attempt to explain reality are like shared necessarily between us in some sense. Like the idea of a science done by one person doesn't make sense. Um, like that. Yeah. So I don't know if I could draw any really broad um, conclusions about the like what attitude analytic philosophers had about the subject or the object. Like, in some sense, that would feel like a debate that they would not want you to have. They'd be like, what are you talking about, the subject and the object? Stop that. Um, oh, yeah. So those aren't even categories for them? I, I guess, I, maybe... I, I would feel if I were to talk about subject and object, I might end up rubbing together, like, things I've, I've read in Platypus and then things I've read in Antic Fossi, but... I mean, obviously the subject, right? Um, the concept goes back to, to Descartes, at least in its like modern form. Um, and he's very much like, yeah, fav favoured by analytic philosophers. They love his foundationalism. At least um, that was one of the first things I read on my... I did philosophy undergraduate and like a very analytically orientated department. And we read Descartes. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think, okay, no, that's interesting, yeah. though, because, like, Heisenberg and Bohr and stuff, they hate Descartes. I mean, they oh, really? hate, but they basically say, you know, he's, okay. um, he's been, finally, we've definitively disproved him. So it's, that's, that's interesting context, for sure. Yeah. Cool, cool. Max, Max, you look like you're thinking. Do you <laughs> One more question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, you said that uh, for Dono... And then philosophy was somewhat of the other side of the coin of Heideggerian ontology. Yeah. What does that mean? Why did you think that? Well, I think... Right, so... When, when I started with the first section, um, discussing these, these two passages, when it came to Adorno... He still only talked about philosophy. He didn't talk about like analytic philosophy and ontology. Um, their moment for realization um, was missed. No, he just said philosophy. And I think, you know, as such in that passage, we understand that I think Adorno thinks that both analytic philosophy and Heideggerian ontological philosophy are the expression of a genuine need of society. Um, and you know, in many ways, he says they like mirror each other. Like the famous, I mean, I didn't so talk about so much talk about anti metaphysics, and I really tried to, to get away from the idea that analytic philosophers are anti metaphysics. Um, but I suppose there is a broad trend amongst like the the major schools of analytic philosophy in the in the twenties and thirties and forties of being anti metaphysics, and and the the argument was that it, that metaphysics was meaningless, like metaphysical language is ultimately meaningless. And then the funny thing is, right, that they accused Heidegger of metaphysics, like most famously. Um, and in fact, Heidegger, I think the way Adorno says it, I, I wouldn't know personally, he says that actually Heidegger's accusation of the analytic philosophers was, or the logical positivists, was that they were, um, they were being meaningless. And they were make, weren't making any sense. And he felt that... Uh, and metaphysical as well. I don't, I don't know if... I, I mean, I can't remember if, if he accused them of metaphysics. I'm yeah. sure you know better. But um, but the idea, right, was that, Adorno, uh, that Heidegger thought that they were talking about nothing of any importance or something. That's the way I sort of understood it. That actually Heidegger felt he was really only talking about... He was talking about the only thing that could mean anything today being... Um, might I offer a quick, Yeah, go, uh, continue. I mean, also kind of one thing where I think Lukács helps think about, um, I mean, just like a, a rough way I would put it, is that if you think about like Hegelianism and Marxism as a dialectical identity of subject and object, then this, the unity of subject and object goes away, and what stays is a kind of reified objectivity in analytic philosophy, 
Uh, and in Heideggerian philosophy. Like, no, but uh, I would like say Heideggerian and this kind of um, also postmodernism that comes out of it is more like the voluntaristic subjectivism side of it. But that's what comes out of it. Heidegger is very objectivistic. I think Adorno says, no, right, that the, 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 the concept of being is like in its complete st apparent stripness of conceptuality and like being concrete, it's like also reified. It's like the thing that like, is apparently unmediated thing, being. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think that's a very funny point. And I think it's, I think it's maybe at least um, in terms of pedagogically, it's, it's a nice one. Uh, that Adorno makes, like, um, as he seems to mostly treat of Heidegger, because I think the the fact that the logical positivists seemed anti metaphysical seemed to dismiss them for him already slightly as philosophers, that's my impression. Um, but the way in which he says they're like they're like opposites that, but not really. They seem to oppose each other, but it's only a seeming not a really op real opposition um, that really maybe just conveys the first thing that it's not about like what one says or like what one's doctrine is word for word um, for, for Adorno and having this perspective on philosophy um, yeah I just think it's a good one yeah cool yeah Anyone else? Any other questions? Or like, um, I mean, yeah, I should have said at the beginning that perhaps um, if anyone wanted, I could have gone into some of the like history parts a bit more. But I felt like that would have been slightly opposed to the point of the teaching. Like, yeah, I did really want to address. Yeah, you know, I put the point about why why I talk about philosophy at the end, and it it went through a few changes actually. There were there. Were, there was a point where I was basically saying we talk about philosophy because the left talk about it and no, and no other reasons <laughs> and if they're not talking about it everyone should shut up but uh, but in the end I think yeah, I came to the conclusion right that no philosophy it tasks us in a certain way so even if the left weren't talking about it to be like anti someone discussing philosophy would seem somewhat anti-intellectual or something like this like um would seem resignative and like an empty dislike of of a place where maybe free thought is possible to some degree. Would you like for that to stop talking about philosophy? I don't think I have any hopes whether they do it more or not. I guess I would hope that if they do talk about it, that it would be um I don't know. I guess um not in itself, no, that's the simplest answer. I, yeah. Of course it, like the discussion of philosophy shouldn't be just like gratuitous. Like as much as anything shouldn't be done gratuitously. Um for its own sake. Um but yeah I don't think there's either like a massive problem or a massive um, great thing about talking about it. But in some sense, like the immediate motivation for the teaching was that it had been discussed um, most recently. And it's a really confusing thing. Like uh, I did have that passage about how I sort of want to apologize for talking about philosophy. And that is a genuine feeling sometimes. Um, yeah. Um, but I don't think it should be, should, uh, anyone should let it overtake them. Or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. There's room for discussion of philosophy on the left. There's no reason why the left, I'm not talking about specifically the present one, shouldn't discuss philosophy. That's the ultimate point. Yeah. Cool. Anyone else? Any other questions? It seems like there's perhaps a climax of tension in the room. About whether, um, yeah. Do I call it? 
Der Weinstapel? Mm. Ah, you, you wrote... Um, no, I have a lot of questions, but, oh, but I don't... Oh, yeah, Marius, do you have no, any questions? I, I, you can I ask me. I can't bring them together in, in, in a good question. Okay, so okay. I thought, maybe it's a good... Yeah. And when you return to the... Yeah, okay, yeah, good point, and, good point. Okay, well, thank you everyone for coming. Yeah. Time. <laughs> <laughs>